Good morning, everybody. We're gonna do some. We're gonna start doing some resilience talking here in a second. Let's look at that backdrop. Look at that backdrop. Sounds good. Everybody, if you would, please uh, just go from left to right. Once again, talking to the mic, I just want to check the mic levels really quick. Uh, Spartan World Media Fest. Check, check, check. Thanks, Mike. Spartan World Media Fest. Check, check, check. <laughs> we had to check every time. Go ahead, Chuck. Spartan yeah. Media yeah. Fest. Yeah. World yeah. Championship. Yeah. Oh. Check, 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 check. <laughs> and Misty. Misty Diaz, check, check. One, two, three. Let me say that this drifts in. You want it lowered? Huh? Where, where do you want the mic? Where do you want the mic? I think I'm tiny. You want to be like right there? Yeah, that's fine. I'm a one air man. The mic is bigger than me. <laughs> oh. I just stripped it. That's awesome. That's cool. Lola, you're getting. I can make it higher. I put my tripod. You're good to get started. I'm going to switch Misty's mic out on the fly really quick. Two pieces lower. Okay, so. started here. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Lonnie Bain. I'm the founder of Red Shoes Living and the moderator for the Spartan X Leadership Series. And we've got a great panel of amazing human beings and experts today. We're going to talk about life lessons on persistence. Recording here this uh, from Spartan Media Fest brought to you by ATP Science. And really grateful to be with you. I want to introduce the panel without further ado. We have Misty Diaz, a uh, credible human being, resilient, gritty human being, who has done over 70 Spartan races, 200 plus road races, world records, Red Bull 400. She's done all kinds of events. And has also got spina bifida, but you would never know that because <laughs> she crushes life. We also have Sean Douglas here uh, from the Blog Talk Radio, Life Transformation Radio. Another amazing human being. I've been able to spend some time with Sean, get to know him a little bit. And I'm really excited to talk to him about purpose and some of the work that he's doing as it relates to our topic today. To my left, I have retired Colonel uh, Tim Nye, who's a, a good friend of mine and uh, probably could take the stage and stay here for four or five hours just telling stories about his career and his life in the military and everything that he's done. Then we have another good man over here, the Spaniard, Charlie Brenneman, a uh, friend of mine who, a uh, former Spanish teacher, became UFC fighter, now is an author and uh, talks about the books that uh, has changed his life and reading books and another gritty individual. Um, so welcome everybody here. It's, it's good to be with you. And here's where I want to start. So if we talk about our topic for today, persistence, res resilience, and grit. One of the things that comes to mind, I know we've all got stories about this, but we talk about how these moments in life define us, and some people say that they don't. But as I think about all of you and everything that you've accomplished today, I think about mindset. Whenever you come to an obstacle in your life uh, or trying to overcome something, and I want to just turn, Charlie, I'm going to turn to you for a minute, because I remember the story, uh, not to start off with this, you're probably going to kill me for this, but you're a UFC fighter, and I remember having a conversation with you about getting knocked down and what that was like. And talk, talk to me for just a minute about the mindset. You know, you come to an obstacle, uh, you're in a fight, and you actually get knocked down. How did you get through that? What's the mindset, the greatness that gets you through something like that? The thing I like most about it was very black and white. They put you against the wall and you had to do it. They closed the door and then they 
obviously fight, and then you have another guy coming at you trying to tear your head off. Uh, getting knocked down and you knock out. I'll go with the knocked out because that's the worst part. Uh, but it's symbolic in life that I was unconscious on TV, opened my eyes, and thought a lot of things. But, but at the end of it was I, uh, I have a choice. I can lay here. They're not going to let me lay here. I have to get up or I can get up. And then so I got up. And then you go to the center of the ring. They raise his hand. Don't raise your hand. You feel like an idiot, embarrassed, vulnerable, all that stuff. And then you walk out, and then you just take another step, and another step, and then that metaphorically is light. So it, it, it's a perfect symbolism of getting back up after getting knocked out. Yeah, I think what's interesting about that, Colonel Knight, I'm going to turn to you. Like when you uh, when you get to that point where you take one step in front of the other, you know, what do you discover in yourself along the way? Is it a surprise when you come up to an obstacle or a tough situation, and you can see it, and you have to get through it? You know, or do you surprise yourself along the way in terms of what you can do? Yeah, I, I think that you probably do. I think most people probably do, right? I don't think many people understand how far or how hard they can push themselves into the night until something important to them is on the line, right? What is what is it that you want to achieve and what is it that you're willing to pay to, to get there? So, you know, I think people surprise themselves um, by making it, but, but nobody makes it unless they kind of believe that they can. Because if you don't believe you can do it, then you're never going to do it, right? I don't want to get cliche, but you got to have the belief first. you got to have the Misty, I'm, I'm going to come down to you on this, but you and I were talking this morning about mindset, you know, what mindset you have, and you brought up it's the team, part of your mindset and part of how you prepare and part of how you have accomplished everything you have and your grittiness is the team. Talk about the team that's around you. Um, so, you know, my front row, it, it's, you know, there's two, for, for me, there's two different, two different levels. I have my front row of people. <laughs> that's my solid wall of just people who just are support me, encourage me on a daily basis that, you know, if I have an issue, I go and talk to them and only those people in that front row. I don't tell everybody. <laughs> those are my solid front row people. And then I have, you know, those who I build my team with, you know, just one small example over hundreds and hundreds of other examples I have um, where, you know, just simply climbing. You know, I went to Colorado Springs, uh, what, a week ago to go climb Man 2. And if anyone has seen those stairs, I'm 4'4", 78 pounds, 80 pounds on a good day. Like, um, some of the stairs were like up to here to me. And immediately I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this. But knowing that I had three other people right behind me that were like, no, just stop, figure out how you can adapt. Just that one, like, you know, just knowing that I had that support and was like, you know what, you're right. time I had to rely on my team but you know what it's 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 not just me relying on them it's us feeding off each other's energy there's moments in you know races that I've done where I've been on the course for 14 hours and I've had some burst of energy and my team has it so I'm like let's go guys whether I'm singing or like you know just just getting them riled up and then it's been the other way around where you know so <laughs> is a big part of, of uh, your yeah. focus and who you are and and I think when you're yeah. gritty you have an objective you know at Spartan we're trying to, to finish the race and some people are trying to win the race and some people are trying to have a good experience and finish the race so you create this purpose sometimes before you even start how important is purpose in all of this uh, it's the very focal point have to have a why you have to have a reason to get out the course you have to have a reason to get back up after you've been knocked down some people don't some people lay there and some people get up and 
when you have that resilience and you have that grit, you have that purpose, you have that why, and it's all pushed together, why wouldn't you give up? So either you make it happen no matter what, or you make excuses on why it didn't happen for you. Yeah. You know, I was kind of coming back to this, and this is for everybody, and Charlie, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, do you have a certain mindset? You know, so you've had these experiences in your life, getting knocked out, coming back from that, and I remember last year seeing you after the Spartan race, and, and you had put everything out there on the course, and you were spent, and sitting down talking to you. Do you have a, a rhythm or a pattern that you go through uh, in life when an obstacle comes in front of you? so many missions over the years and, and how do you prepare other leaders that you've worked with if you're talking to somebody and you're getting ready to, you know to do a mission talk us through you know what are the words that you use to talk somebody through something that's very difficult that's in front of them excellent question no i think i think for leaders if you talk to leaders they've already got all the basics so they wouldn't they wouldn't be where they're at so you're asking me a question how do you prepare a leader you just got to always remind them that they are the leader, so they have the duties and the responsibilities of, of being that model, right? A lot of people, I think, think being a leader means that you have to be the best at everything, and, and that's not true. What you have to do is everything you do, it has to be your best, right? Because if it isn't, people will, will sense that immediately, and then you'll, they'll lose trust and confidence in you. So you just got to remind, remind guys that, okay, everybody that works for you or that you're in charge of, they're in your care. So everything, you've got to constantly remind, remember that, that while you're the leader, you're actually their support. You've got to be driving them and pushing them. And, and you know, the whole uh, sweat more uh, in training, the lead, the bleeding less, you know, in real life. So you got to be hard, but you still have to have that empathy behind you as well. And the empathy part of it is you're trying to keep them alive, you know, when, when it really comes down to it. So the harder, the harder you go, hopefully the easier it will be. And that's what they've done. That's perfect. Misty, I'm going to on this um, as well. And uh, you know, go walk, through, walk through a routine for me. So let's just take one of the races, or even what you talked about for all of us. For each of us to be Tell me, when you woke up that morning, how did, how did you mentally prepare for that? Because we're talking a lot about the mental part of the game and the emotional part of the game. I immediately go in gratitude. That pretty much fuels everything that I do, everything that I say, every challenge that I take on. I'm, my story is a little different, uh, so I see things differently. Uh, you know, having a severe disability, having to go through over 28 operations, you know, waking up in ICU, living months, months, <laughs> six plus months sometimes at UCLA Hospital, um, wondering what it's like to be able to do something, have a job, you know, go on a date, I don't know, go get coffee. Like, I didn't know any of that. Like, I didn't start living my life until about eight years ago. So, you know, immediately, you know, looking outside my window, like a gratitude list 
not only that, but you know, I mentor children who have my condition from all over the world. And these kids are like waiting to see what little Misty does next. So, you know, it, it just, it's really simple. It's just gratitude. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I had people around me. I was in the military battling alcohol abuse, um, battling deployments, coming back from a deployment, the things that changed, the reintegration process. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we military guys and, and gals, we, we have problems reintegrating back into life because everything is gone without us, especially if you have wife and kids or husband or whatever. Uh, I just didn't integrate well, and I'd rather be on the road. I'd rather be in the desert doing, you know, doing what I was born to do. But when I got so far down into myself, I felt a lot of failure. Felt like I wasn't good enough. There was a lot of introspective stuff that was happening, and uh, and I learned through that suicidal moment that failure is okay. And that's unpopular with some people. You have to be okay with failing because there's so much learning in failure, so much learning. And failure and success is subjective. Some people won't get on this course out here because they're scared. So you could say that they failed. Some people will get on the course no matter what they feel, and they maybe won't finish. Are they a success or are they a failure? Did you get on the course? Yes. Then you'd be a success over people who haven't gone on the course. My mindset changed to where it's okay to fail, and there's a lot of learning and failure as long as you fail forward. It's all about resilience. Resilience is about going forward. Everybody wants to call it bouncing back, and I don't want to go backwards, I want to go forwards. I want to bounce forward. Everything I do, if I stumble and fall, someone's gonna be there to pick me up. If there's not someone there to pick me up, then I need to be able to pick myself up. So you have to learn to be resilient. And your mindset is 80% of that. 100%, 80% of that. To gratitude, they've actually linked science to the number one reason why people don't take their life. And the reason why stress, anxiety, and depression has been decreased in people's lives is due to their increase in gratitude. Gratitude is the number one skill used to, to decrease anxiety, stress, and depression. So I, to talk about that, and Colonel Lyman will come right back to you on this gratitude part. But what I, the other thing I found with leaders, great leaders, I think, are there, when you're grateful and you're open, and you allow people to step into your life and opportunities to step into your life. And I think one of the first times I did a Spartan race and I needed help on an obstacle. And I was a little ungrateful that day and I was not feeling very good and I didn't want anybody to help me. And pretty soon people didn't want to help me, you know? And then, then my mind started shifting and went, wait a minute, I do you know, need this help. So I think when you're ungrateful, you become small. Your world becomes small. You don't let people in, opportunities don't come in, you become very cynical. And again, you know, with the four of you, incredibly grateful people. Pearl and I have known you for a long time now, and you know, know your history and everything. But you always show up with one of the best attitudes and, and, and as a grateful human being. And you know, just talk about what that means to you. Well, I mean, I always, I mean, I think it's better than the alternative, right? I mean, thankfully, you know, Sean is, looks like he's come through that dark period. I mean, many people don't. So, uh, showing up, being part of it, being part of the team. Be having a surrounding, having a culture, is all better than not, right? And it's magnitudes better than not. So, I, and it, it's interesting when you talk about being open. A lot of people don't ask for help, and, and a lot of people are afraid to ask for help. Uh, and yet, I have learned from traveling with Joe DeSena, uh, I've been fortunate uh, to meet a lot of um, influential people and a lot of wealthy people. And I have found that it's pretty much the more successful a person is, the more open they are generally to help you. 
um, you know, when you have a lot, uh, people seem generally uh, pretty easy about sharing, or at least giving you advice or helping you along the way. So I think you can do this. being grateful I, I, don't, I don't know I don't know that I've ever correlated that uh, but I do know that I'm a grateful thankful person and I'm super competitive the, the most uh, prominent thing that I've learned and this was from a couple of military guys is the balance of ego and humility when it comes to competition because I slide down the slippery slope of ego but I'll tell you a time over time earlier when you get knocked out cold and you're totally embarrassed that kind of gets rid of a lot of ego. So something so simple as yesterday on the flight here, that there was a business class bathroom. And I was like, I don't really know the protocol here. Am I allowed to use that bathroom or not? And I thought, well, if I say it out loud, someone might think I'm a, I'm a whatever, a stupid, I don't know. And I thought, I don't care. And I said, am I allowed to use that bathroom or not? So it's just like, the, the real being embarrassed big time, like makes all those little stupid embarrassments be like, I don't care, yeah, I'm, I'm, whatever. I'm silly, I don't know. What? You know? But I think uh, for me personally, it was developing the ability to fight and beat someone up. It gives me that confidence, like, what, what, what? What, 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 what is it? What do you want to do? It looks silly. It looks silly. But learn and ask. And give us a perfect example. I ask him all kinds of questions. He just answers me sincerely. Also, it's interesting, you know, we've all mentioned Joe and talked about heard Joe sometimes talk about the new generation and how it's, just, it's a soft generation. And um, I've got four kids, and I think that my children, and, you know, they, they do have a different outlook on life. And, and so, this is a question for all of you. Um, are we a softer generation now, or is resiliency and grit and persistence showing up in a different way for the new generation now? I love this question. Thank you, Sean. I love this question. Uh, you can't compare generation to generation because we've dealt with different, like when I was a kid, I was born in 83, we grew up a lot different. We didn't have the internet, we had vice versa, and if the president was on every channel, then you're not watching TV that night. Like, you know what I mean? And then cable started coming up, and then the internet, I mean, I remember Windows 95. Like, I actually encourage my kids to have more screen time Everybody's like, screen time is awful for your children. I encourage them to be on their tablets and phones and stuff as much as they can because they're connecting with the world. That is their language. That is how they grow up. They're not falling out of trees and you know doing stupid stuff, like lighting stuff on fire like when I was a kid. Like We do different things. We experience different things. My personal opinion is I'm 36. My generation said, I don't like how my parent parented. I'm going to do it different, and I'm going to take care of them so much. And then you pandered to them and then made them, made them weak. There's a reason why parents parented that way. And then you hated the way your parents parented. And then we be, the, the kids that we have are not products of you not liking the way that you got parented. Like There's a reason why you got parented that way. When I parent according to what's going on around me, like sex trafficking, I have three daughters, 12, five, and two. I literally tell my five-year-old, I'm like, do you want to get trafficked to Mexico? Then don't walk away from me. Like, I, I make no bones about anything. I don't say, oh, stop doing that. Like, I will punish you or whatever, you know what I mean? And she knows the deal. Like, if I point, like, I'm like, I'm dead serious, she knows to knock it off. 
but I make no bones about anything. I tell my 16 year old son, I'm like, if you get a girl pregnant, like you're gonna have consequences. And I tell about the consequences. I don't hold anything back. I swear in front of my kids. I sometimes swear at my kids. Like, I don't care what people think about my parenting. But I'll tell you what, my five year old, she tells these other kids what the, what the business is. And she's so tech savvy. She's gonna be the next Tony Robbins or influencer. So that's Then you grew up, and this is why, and I explained that to my kids. So, Charlie, what do you what do you think about what Sean just said there? Um, I definitely don't encourage a lot of screen time. I, I think there's a certain human components that, that are important. I think interpersonal communication is huge. I do think he's justified in what he's saying about comparing generations. Um, you're right, I mean, it's very different. But to answer your question, are they softer? Yeah, they're, they're a lot softer. But it is within the context of life is different. They don't have to be hard, right? It, it's pretty easy. But uh, I, I just think that there's interpersonal human being skills that are being lost in the shuffle. And if you really listen and really look at the big picture of artificial intelligence and where the world's going, it looks like we're becoming less and less helpful, more and more helpless, that it is getting to like, okay, maybe human beings are evolving out of being human beings, you know? Um, but I'm really direct, you know, with, with my kids. And one of the ways I feel, and I've heard it from a lot of successful people slash parents, is just explaining things, like talking to them. My wife really, you're talking to them like they're adults. They're mm -hmm. six and three. Like, I think, yep. sorry, like, they, 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 yep. I, I mean, I'm not, whatever, but I'm, I'm explaining to them. They might not get it, but I think in the long term, and it being like ingrained in their fra fabric. Um, but yeah, doing tough stuff, having my kids do tough stuff is very important. Yeah, and I think that's what I've learned too with my youngest son. He's, he's done a couple of smarts. You know, the first time he did that, he didn't know what to expect. Yeah. Um, and he probably came in with a mindset that was, do you really have to do this? And do I have to run? And, and as he got part you know, got in there, and there was the people around him, the community, the energy, and he rose, and then he crushed it, you know? But it's getting, I think it's getting new leaders, whether it's younger or older, to try new experiences. So, Misty, you talk to a lot of you. And you <laughs> inspire a lot of people. Talk, talk to me about this. I was just going to say, like, again, I see things completely different. I'm a dog mom for life, um, so I don't have any children. But I do have uh, the advantage of going into schools and speaking to your kids and your kids are on social media and guess who they dm guess who they comment and like under my pictures and you know by me this is a really good topic so i see so here's the thing is you know by me going into the schools the number challenge and it's so crazy because it's 2019 times have changed but the the textbooks and the lessons have not we're these children are faced with situations uh, issues I'm sorry that we weren't I wasn't dealing with I was climbing trees my dad built a swing in my front yard and he was like I just want you to swing on it they had to take it down because I would jump on the wood swing where you sit down and then I would climb the rope. No joke, I had pictures. Then I would climb into the tree, throw my crutches far away so they couldn't find me. And I would just sit there and read a book. And they're like, you're gonna kill yourself. But <laughs> they were not doing things like that. They're going online, you know, they're facing bullying. They're facing, um, you know, just really, you know, people are picking these kids apart. So, you know, again, I think, you know, the parents just really need to spend time with their children. I think, you know, the school system to bring in, you know, acceptance and bullying awareness. I mean, I, uh, nine times out of ten, I'm like, I'll just be for free. Just, you know, like, because I just don't, I, if I have the ability to help and go into those schools and classes, then I will take that opportunity. 
because I, I know what it was like. I grew up being bullied, but not to this severe. No. And one thing, what she said was that people are following her, which is one reason why I encourage more screen time. My kids are following Ninja, Marshmallow, you know, PewDiePie, whatever that dude does. I don't even know what that dude does. But they're following these online influencers. And when I told my 16 year old, I was like, dude, I'm gonna go, you know, hang out with the Spartan guys and, and girls and, you know, do this whole media thing. And he's like, that is so cool. And he's watching YouTube videos about Spartan. And he's, he's like, that is amazing. You cannot BS these kids today because they'll Google the crap out of you. You know, like, like they just, there's, I feel like my kids anyways, are so more well-informed than just watching the five o'clock news. They're following influencers and they're getting their information from online influencers. Yeah, but that's because you take the time to parent. Okay, fair enough. There's people who don't take the time and say, here's a tablet, parent yourself. Oh yeah, no, that's not good. Hey, just, just real quick, because I want to I wanna maybe take the opposite view here and it might surprise you. I, I, am, I have the uh, older brother. I mean, I've got, I've got children the age of children, the age of grandchildren, the age of Sean's children. So uh, I, I will tell you, uh, I, I think overall millennials might get a little bit of a bad rap. Uh, we've been at war for 18 years. Everybody fighting that war is a millennial. The vast majority of them. Got an awful lot of kids that still go off and do those kinds of things. You take a look at this competition we're doing here today. Guarantee you most of the people that are on the, the lower end of, you know, 30, 35 than they are at, you know, mid-60s, right? So, so yeah, I mean, I was, we, each generation probably has less opportunity. Um, and so, so are they harder, physically harder? I don't know, every world record gets set, gets set by a young man, or a young gal, right? So, you know, everything that's ever been done by anybody my age has been redone better by somebody younger. So maybe overall our society has gotten weaker, but I think there's still plenty of hope for most of the, the young people. They just, they're looking for a purpose. And they're looking as, as you already said, they're looking for that purpose. The person who gives purpose is uh, But the ability and kind of desire is there. Just like the flame. That's what I'm talking about right here. You touched on stuff, and I'll come back to everybody on this one too, just in terms of grit, because you know there's a lot of talk about grit being a great fighter. And so, like, before you talk about that, I was thinking about all the different soldiers you've worked with over the years and the different generations, and you said it perfectly. So my question, and I'm going to come right back to you on this one, is how do you teach grit, or can you teach grit, um, or do you have to experience? I think some people come out, you're talking specifically the military, some people come into it because of their You know, once you survive the storm, you know, you're not worried about a little bit of wind, you know, kind of thing. So that's what it is. It's, they put you in positions that are extraordinarily hard and attack you physically, emotionally. And then uh, when you come out the other side of that, just like this obstacle course and the obstacle of unity, well, you know, you can face the next one even easier. Yeah. Charlie, I'm coming to you, just thinking of the USC and stepping into the ring, you know, for the first time when you step into that ring. 
back to grittiness, um, you know, how does that show up for you? And then how do you translate that now into the, the life and the current path? The, the thing I like about fighting, and I don't maybe subconsciously is why I started fighting, is it, it like I said, really puts you against the wall. I'm, I was so scared of fighting. Hated it more than anything. I think it goes back to middle school, like just knuckleheads that would always want to fight me and maybe I'm so scared to get in trouble, blah, blah, blah. I was so stinking scared it was down in Charlotte, North Carolina, my first UFC fight. Not not my first fight, but my first UFC fight. So, such a big scale, such a, oh my gosh, I'm here, I'm here. I'm so stinking scary, but you don't have a choice. You've got to do it. You just, boom, you sign a contract, you've got to do it. So then that opens it up, you know, to life in general. Everything is so easy. And it started with wrestling, honestly. Wrestling is a harder sport than professional fighting. Uh, but just learning to sacrifice, cutting weight, making weight, not eating Thanksgiving, not eating Christmas, going to college, parties, not partying at all. Just such a hardcore life. Honestly, now when I when my first, I used to be a teacher. My first day of teaching, I was listening to everybody complain about everything. And I was sitting there like, you know you can, thinking, you know you can drink as much water as you want today. Like that, much water. So if I drink water, this is the best day ever. And it just four days out with distance yourself a little bit more, allow them to experience a little bit more, and then be there when they fall. And I'm 38, and, and I feel like I'm in a pretty good spot. So it might take half or all of a lifetime to develop that, but it's just kind of like this gradual process of implementation. That's perfect. And on that thing, we're going to run short on time, so I want to come back to everybody on uh, just you know one one takeaway for those that are listening here and those that are listening on the, on the recording. Uh, I'm 52 years old and I have this philosophy as it relates to resiliency and grit and uh, for me it's, it is about experiences and trying new things and every once in a while I get in a situation and, and this is literally what I say, I stop and I say how the hell did I get here? Mm -hmm. and, but it keeps me alive and, I, and so that's, that's for me the one thing, I just keep putting myself out there and keep trying to you know, scare myself. So uh, resilience is your ability to withstand, recover, and grow through adversity and stress. And grit is earned in the field. That's what we always used to say. I was a drill instructor for basic training. We used to say grit is earned in the field. You can't get it just watching videos, thinking about it, reading a book. It's like entrepreneurship. You can't build a business by reading a book. You actually have to go and do it and get your face well. So resilience is your ability to withstand, recover, and grow through that adversity and stress. that guy better than me. And I always arrive at the answer. Nothing. You know, I 
just got to believe, but he's 